Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. It's November 11th, 2022. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let's just throw around some thoughts on boxing. Then let's dive into Sonny Edwards versus Felix Alvarado. Just know that Alvarado, big underdog, greater than a plus 300, has not lost since 2014. But first, let's back up. Connor Ben. You know what? After a lot of bravado, a lot of bravado, um, you know, before his planned fight against Chris Eubank, then, of course, he gets busted, um, starts failing drug tests, right, for, uh, let's say, female hormonal type imbalances in his uh, drug samples. Of course, Conor Ben starts saying, hey, I don't know how this could happen. How could anyone accuse me of cheating, even though it's somewhat obvious looking at his films now that the guy seems to have extra muscle on him, right? Well, now authorities are cracking down on him. I'll just say good for authorities, right? While I think ultimately they're fighting a losing battle, if you're going to have rules, you're going to have to enforce those rules. And to Connor Ben, I'll just say, you stray, you pay. Right? So let the chips fall where they may with Connor Ben. I think the attitude boxing needs to have is look, player, we're not interested in the story here. Right? You're responsible for what's in your drug test sample. It's as simple as that. This is strict liability. Right? If your drug, excuse me, if your drug test sample has uh, female hormones and all this stuff in there that shouldn't be in there, you're going to get pinched, right? Period. You know, Nigel Ben, big time slugger, of course, has come to the defense of his son. We understand that's what fathers do, right? The bottom line is Nigel Ben's retired. He doesn't know what his son's doing. Right? The best evidence we have of what his son's been doing are his drug test samples. Player, that's what we're going to judge you by. Right, You can't have a sport where Gerald Miller fails a drug test, he's out for two years, and we're somehow supposed to look the other way when it's Conor Ben. That's not how it works. Every boxer needs to be put on notice about that. Also, from time to time, different subject, I check box rec like everyone else, right? I'm doing research like everyone else. Now, at lightweight, if I ask you, who's the best lightweight on the planet? What would your answer be? 135, right? For many of you, for many of you, the answer would be Devin Haney. Right? There's another group at 135 who will say, look, the answer really should be Lomachenko. Right? He lost to Teofimo Lopez, who's now up at 140. Right? He's gone. The question is simply, can anybody beat Loma at 135? There's another group of you that will say, yes, there is. Shakur Stevenson, right? Who BoxRec has as the top at 130, right? But just to understand, Shakur Stevenson in interviews has said, hey, man, you know, brother's getting older. I might move up to 135, right? He doesn't want to skip dessert. He doesn't want the smaller serving size when it comes to food anymore. So I'm sure Shakur eventually is going to be at 135, right? He's called out Loma. Well, Understand that BoxRec has Gervonta Davis as the top shelf at 135. 
right? Now, I'm not here to pick and choose in this video between Gervonta, Devin Haney, Lomachenko, Shakur Stevenson, right? I know there's some of you who believe that Loma lost his last fight, right? Okay, fine. His opponent, by the way, his last fight, you need to keep an eye on him too. Well, what I am here to say, though, is that it's when you have disagreements like this around a weight class that there are going to be huge opportunities to make money. Right? Clearly, there's the crowd. If Botsrek has Gravante as number one at 135, clearly there is the crowd that would take Gervonta Davis, whoever he fights at 135. Right? That's clear. If you believe that Devin Haney, what more does a brother have to do? Right? Then travel halfway around the globe, beat a champion in the champion's backyard, not once but twice, and do it convincingly. I know there's a Devin Haney crowd that's going to say, hey, look, our guy's unbeaten. What do you want our guy to do? He's traveling internationally to prove himself. He has the belts. Right? So keep an eye on 135. That's a riveting weight class right now. The disagreement among the boxing hardcore, among the public, coupled with the high level of fighters we're talking about, right? Loma, two Olympic gold medals, right? Devin Haney, unbeaten, has beaten people like Jorge Linares, right? Gravante Davis, unbeaten, right? Has won belts in multiple divisions, right? Has beaten Leo Santa Cruz, has beaten Mario Barrios, Right? Just understand that if you're a gambler looking for opportunities, if you're a gambler looking for a lack of consensus where the odds might be skewed, right? where you might be getting a two-time Olympic gold medalist as an underdog in big fights, 135 is the place to look. Let me also applaud Box Rack. You know, um, I lived during the Swen Aki era, right? I understand that there's some fighters out there who, and I understand Aki fought Anthony Mundine and some other people, but there's some fighters out there who can go through an era where Canelo's in their division for a moment in time. Danny Jacobs is in their division for a moment in time. Golovkin is in their division. And they somehow fight none of them and then want to tell you that they're the best and that you should take their unbeaten record seriously. Well, that's Jamal with an A, Charlo. Right? I see him in interviews. He's full of himself. You know, he's talking about being the man. Everyone else is to blame for him not getting big fights. Meanwhile, you're looking at Canelo fighting in the division. Golovkin, Danny Jacobs, moving up, fighting guys at 168. Moving up, he's even fought Beevil at 175, right? And Beevil's not the only champ at 175 he fought. He fought Kovalev. So when I'm hearing that, you know, no one wants to fight Jamal Charlo, and I'm seeing Canelo fighting everyone, except David Benavides, but that might be changing, right? Um, when I see Danny Jacobs in against Golovkin, right? You know, I see Danny Jacobs fighting guys. Um, I see Golovkin in against Canelo, right? I just don't understand how everyone else seems to be fighting everyone else. But yet Jamal Charlo is claiming that he's being left out. So I'm very pleased that you have an unbeaten Jamal Charlo at 160. And yet Box Rack today has Golovkin as their best at 160.
right? Understand, fighters have to earn these distinctions. You can't, you know, act tough in interviews, right? Try to talk yourself up in interviews, claim no one wants to fight you while the other guys are all taking tough fights. I mean, it just makes no sense. Danny Jacobs fought Canelo. I'm supposed to believe that Danny Jacobs, when he was down at 160, was avoiding you? I'll just leave it up to the public as to whether they believe that kind of stuff. Clearly, BoxRec does not. Let me also say this, too. At welterweight, we're being blinded. Right? Um, you know, this Terrence Crawford, Errol Spence thing didn't come together, right? Everyone wants to fight each other, but they won't sign the contract and stuff like that. Okay, look, I uh, get it. Um, you know, my belief is that when guys want to fight, they find a way, right? Both Spence and Crawford are in their 30s. It, it just seems to me that if guys are really focused on legacy, right? The idea would be, hey, man, you're the other champion here who, you know, has all the glory. Let me fight you so we can solve who's top dog here, right? Savvy financial people understand that you get paid for your next fight after your last fight. Whoever wins, Spence Crawford, would make a boatload after that, right? They'd have the legitimacy that comes with the win, assuming the win is a real win, right? Let me just add as an aside, since I'm riffing here, I love the Clarissa Shields, Savannah Marshall contract, which said, hey, if it's a split decision, then there's a mandatory rematch clause someone can enforce, right? That fight wasn't a split decision, but you need clauses like that in the sport because you and I know. You watch these fights, then the judges render their verdicts, and you're thinking to yourself, that's not the fight I saw, right? So let's say if there was a clear winner, you know, that we all agreed on, or at least most of us, because there's always that lunatic in the corner there, the 4%, who will say, hey, what are you talking about? My guy won this fight. But if there was a clear winner in Crawford Spence, we all understand that that guy would really be exalted. That guy would have extra credibility. His next fight would be a bonanza. Well, they couldn't work it out. It's disturbing that, you know, one guy was being offered guarantees, the other guy wasn't. Right? I, I completely get the idea that guys say, look, you know, I'm here to negotiate in good faith. If you're going to diss me, if this is one of those Hollywood-type deals where I'm supposed to get some profit participation and the definition of profit is nebulous, where I have to hire a team of accountants to, you know, review the books, added cost to me to make sure that I'm getting my percentage, I completely understand people walking away from situations like that. Right? So, I'll just say... With all the smoke, it blinds you from the question of who's the best at welterweight. I agree with Box Rack. I'd take Crawford over Spence if they fought. And Box Rack has Terrence Crawford over Spence. Right now, I know there's some young people out there, and I don't really have an answer for you, who are going to talk about uh, Jaron Ennis and who, of course, are going to talk about Virgil Ortiz, right? Look, <laughs> I hear you. Boxing's a young man's sport. These 30-somethings are totally clouding the picture, right? It'll sort itself out in time. Let me just say this. Just off the cuff, I believe Spence is going to have all he can handle with Keith Thurman. Right? So let's see how the whole thing plays out. And I'll agree, Spence was magnificent. Spence was prime Spence against Ugas. I'll concede that. Right? Quite frankly, I think Terrence Crawford is going to have a tough match 
against David Avenesian. Right? The bottom line is in boxing, your competitors are always threatening the throne. Right? The situation at welterweight is fluid. I will say, though, that I agree with Box Rec that if I had to name a top welterweight right now, just one name, it would be Terrence Crawford. Now, at Flyweight, Box Rec has named Sonny Edwards. Let's talk about Sonny Edwards. He's in his mid-20s. In other words, he's in his prime for this fight style. He fights like Ali. You know what I mean. Right? He's slick. He's smooth. He's hard to find. You throw punches, he trusts his reflexes. There are many times, many times, where Sonny Edwards thinks he has distance read so well that he does not raise a hand. He'll just roll with the punch and let it miss him. He has a lot of near car crashes, guys throwing big punches. I mean big punches. And Sonny Edwards just lets it slide by his face. Right? You understand there's a certain type of puncher who would fake out that kind of approach, who would fake a punch, have Sonny start to move, then who would pivot and throw a different punch. I like Sonny Edwards, 